Good morning. I'm Dr. Siobhan McDonnell from the Crawford School of Public Policy, and I'm co-chairing today's session on renewal in the Pacific beyond COVID challenges, charting new horizons. Today, I'm joining you from Canberra, the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people. Our Australian audience joins us from many different parts of the country. And today we acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on, tradi on whose traditional lands each of us meet. I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd like to thank you for joining us for our panel discussion today. Across the Pacific, we've seen the region face challenges, not only of extremely high rates per capita of COVID in some countries, including Fiji, French Polynesia, and growing numbers of cases in PNG, Timor-Leste and Guam. All countries across the Pacific have restricted travel and many have seen marked downturns in their economies as a result. Developing responses to COVID were occurring in 2020 at the same time that many countries were impacted by tropical cyclone Harold. The second category five cyclone to hit the Western Pacific in the space of five years. So in this panel, we will reflect on these challenges, the experience of living with these challenges and what they've meant in the Pacific, how are specific countries working to keep their people safe and to create economic pathways for renewal? How, could, how can Australia help in this space and how have we been helping? Can we set a new agenda for regionalism? And how can we move forward on climate change? These and other important regional issues are going to frame our discussions today. So I'd like to introduce our eminent speakers to you today. We have Senator Zed Seselja, the Minister for International Development <coughs> and the Pacific, Her Excellency Hanari Patana, the High Commissioner for Samoa, His Excellency Robert Cecilo, High Commissioner for the Solomon Islands, and His Excellency Samson Fare, High Commissioner for Vanuatu. So I'd like to begin and open up our, our first question to the panel. I'd like to ask uh, each of our High Commissioners, because I don't think this gets enough coverage in Australia, um, to really reflect on what their country's experience has been like during this period of COVID-19. Perhaps each of them could really just spend three minutes um, describing that experience to us as an opening. Uh, perhaps, Hanari, if you could go first, that would be right. nice. Well, thank you very much, uh, Siobhan. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to uh, be one of the participants this morning with uh, the Honourable Minister um, as the government speaker. Um, may I also add my own comments in paying my respect to the traditional leaders of the uh, land of Nakunawal and Nakumbri people, uh, both present, past and emerging. Um, Samoa, I would say, uh, was one of the first to actually lock down. And that was because we were just coming out of a measles epidemic in late 2019 when the COVID first came on. And so the immediate um, uh, response was just to lock down and contain the whatever was going to start coming in. I think we already had a first case that had actually entered Samoa and that triggered off um, a lot of, of uh, safety mechanisms. Um, so what did it mean? Um, you know, like everybody else, uh, normal the normal life that you live you know day to day suddenly changed in terms of um, uh, orders that were you know proclamations about what you can do where you can go um, but the immediate well both medium to long-term effect from then was of course the contraction of the economy um, you know uh, the decline in GDP growth at the same time increasing budget deficit. Um, luckily, the key essential services were not affected because the government decided to focus on that. Uh, it, uh, health especially, 
And uh, immediately they went into a national uh, emergency uh, committed to coordinate everything that was uh, had to be coordinated. And what I think the outcome of this is looking at, uh, you know, from the duration of this and the mutating virus um, still spells a lot of unpredictability for all of the small island countries, especially as small open economies <clears throat> and price takers. And right now with the global impact of the pandemic, uh, nobody knows how this is gonna pan out. But, uh, you know, debt stress is probably one of those things. We did have a stimulus package that we um, actually introduced in the first budget, 2019-2020. Uh, and again, in this budget, but um, unfortunately we also had elections and uh, the political uncertainty for about four months uh, and the outcome of which now we will see some uh, by elections. Um, so it'll just add to the cost. And I think the real effect of that stimulus package uh, is highly questionable now because of all of these factors uh, coming into play. But what is the positive side for Samoa? Samoa is probably one of the only, one of the countries that is COVID free at present because we, excuse me, we locked down and we locked down hard. And uh, we continue to do that. And because of that, uh, we also would like to thank our um, development partners who came to the rescue with uh, the vaccines. And the rollout has been pretty good. Um, at present, uh, we're hitting a rate of um, close to 80% for the first jab and close to 50% for the second jab. And so if that momentum is carried, uh, we will probably be good for the rest before the end of the year. And I think we can then probably be much more hopeful in terms of the travel bubble. Mm -hmm. um, and so, the health sector continues to be a primary focus in that. Um, so I think our most immediate concern and need would be to look at that vaccine rollout. I mean, we're now talking in, New Zealand, in Australia and New Zealand of boosters. And if it did come to that, uh, I think all of us island countries of the Pacific are still vulnerable and would certainly look to where we can continue to have that assistance, because that is the key to everything else. Mm -hmm. If there are other areas that we would like to see Australia as sort of um, uh, look at in terms of economic recovery to assist us there, uh, and then Australia has to be commended for a lot of the assistance that went into not just COVID, but the economic uh, recovery by way of uh, readjusting its economic, its uh, aid program. Uh, particularly in terms of financial, uh, financial assistance and also uh, targeting special sectors uh, that had been prioritized by government with respect to the business sector uh, running a, uh, alongside that stimulus pa package that the government has also put out. And I think we would certainly look to two things because these are the two sectors that have been affected, uh, that's agriculture and tourism. And we would certainly look to, first of all, Australia, seeing to the implementation of the PESA Plus, and of course, uh, the continuation um, of the labor mobility schemes. So I will um, stop there for, and give the opportunity to my other colleagues. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. There's a lot really in there, a um, <laughs> whole range of issues. So I'll pass now to His Excellency Robert Cecilio. Thank you. Thank you, Sio. Uh, I, I liken the, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, to a big dark cloud that has uh, descended on our countries and uh, to protect our people and our, our weak uh, health systems. Uh, we, like Samoa, also closed our borders and imposed conditions via declarations of states of emergencies and lockdowns to slow the spread and contain the virus. As a result, I think many local businesses uh, had to uh, close down or scale down their operations and has had a negative effect on the national economy and of course, uh, high unemployment rates. And with many in the formal sector, 
laid off, uh, there is a sharp increase now in poverty rates with many families finding difficult to make ends meet under the current uh, circumstances. But like every uh, black cloud, COVID-19 now they have some silver linings. Uh, without income, I think a lot of families across the region have taken to subsistence farming to stay alive. In the case of Solomon Islands, a lot of people went back to their home islands and villages to sustain themselves. So it is basically our rural people who have helped sustain our economy when we found ourselves in economic strife. As a result, there are now more investments uh, in the cocoa and uh, uh, coconut industries and uh, kava. And we are now uh, exporting uh, cassava to uh, Australia, something we didn't uh, do in the past. And hopefully uh, by the end of this year, if the commercial importation of cover kicks off, then we look forward to have some of cover also landing here in the Australian market. So we can only look to ourselves and our own resources to help create a new economic future for our peoples. But despite uh, closing our land, sea and air borders, I think we continue to work very closely with our development partners, supporting our efforts to contain the virus. And I think it has brought Solomon Islands and Australia closer than ever. Australia has been of great assistance with vaccines. It has so far sent 1 million COVID vaccine doses and pledged another 14 million over the next year. And it has also committed a record aid to the region of $1.44 billion in 2020 and 2021 and recently has also doubled the number of Pacific workers in Australia under the Pacific Labour Scheme and the Seasonal Worker Program, bringing in an extra 12,500 workers. So these are testimonies or cases you know, of this silver lining. And I think I have to acknowledge this and uh, thank you, Minister Zed, and thank you, Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments. Um, and I'll now pass to His Excellency Samson Farin. Um, good morning. Uh, good morning, Long Yifala, everyone. Uh, bonjour. Uh, I, I, I'm joining also my colleagues here today, today online to first of all acknowledge the traditional landowners of the land that I am on today, the Nunawo people. I'd like to pay my respect to uh, past, present and future leaders. And I also pay my respect to uh, the traditional owners of the various lands that you are on today. Um, good morning to Honorable Minister who is with us today. We're very uh, delighted to have you online today with us. And I'd also like to thank ANU for organizing this and giving me the opportunity to say a few words. I think um, um, a lot of uh, similar issues that have already been raised by my good colleague from Samoa and the Solomon Islands about COVID. And uh, we would um, definitely, I would like to join my voice uh, uh, in thanking Australia for all the supports that they provide in terms of COVID uh, package relief to us, uh, not only in terms of vaccines, but also uh, in terms of um, the economic uh, uh, support recovery for COVID-19. Um, uh, my thanks go also to other international partners that have joined force with Australia as well to provide uh, crucial supports to our people uh, in Vanuatu. As you know, Vanuatu closed uh, its borders last year in March and, um, and Vanuatu's economy depend, uh, depends mainly on tourism. And this has uh, badly affected the tourism sector uh, across the country. Um, while we we still um, were still COVID free, and uh, since the beginning of COVID until now, we only had three cases. Um, our economy uh, is badly is badly affected by uh, the closure of the international uh, borders, and uh, which uh, uh, really triggers down into the local community as well, um, especially those that have relied a lot on tourism. Um, I think looking at that, uh, the government has. Uh, put out rapidly back home uh, some stimulus package to support small businesses. But uh, again, COVID got really all of us by surprise. And that means that we have to come up with a lot of different uh, innovative solutions to tackle the problem at hand. 
Um, we, I, I'd like to also mention that the government has focused heavily on the agriculture sector. And as you might know, uh, we've recently had our national agriculture week on the island of Tana. And this was a success whereby uh, we bring um, a lot of farmers from across the countries to come and uh, display their produce, but also display their techniques on and, and pr provide more of a, uh, I would say, a platform where um, people can come and, and, and see how agriculture can actually be a, a benefit to uh, the current situations in the country. Um, on a number of issues uh, that I'd like to raise uh, in moving forward, um, I'd, I'd like to say that uh, Vanuatu, like other Pacific Island countries, uh, we've already faced with a lot of uh, um, uh, a lot of uh, negative impact of the climate change. And so, before COVID, um, uh, the climate change has uh, um, uh, has already affected the economy of the country in terms of uh, uh, a lot of different. Um, uh, negative impacts that we've noticed in the country, especially erosion of the important, um, you know, uh, infrastructure, because most of our islands in the Pacific, the infrastructure are located on the coastal uh, area. And so this is a big one that uh, we faced in the country, but also displacement, internal displacement of people as well, because of the negative impact of climate change. And so um, adding to that, COVID has uh, definitely put another another layer of uh, complexities in terms of uh, the issues that climate change has already brought forward to us. And so, um, like other Pacific Island countries, uh, our small and vulnerable economies have sometimes to uh, uh, either innovate or either sink. And so uh, Vanuatu decides that, you know, we need to move forward and we need to find solutions when it comes to adaptation uh, in terms of uh, um, climate change, but also in terms of recovery with COVID-19. Um, I'd like to uh, also mention in terms of the different supports that we have received as well and how can we move forward in uh, also implementing them. I think uh, looking right now as it stands right now, um, all the government stimulus will obviously will come to an end uh, and we will now have to think forward on how to uh, make sure that we recover from this COVID, but we also look into the long term. But uh, looking into long term means that comes with responsibilities, but also challenges that uh, are at hand and you know ahead of us i think um for us agriculture would be one of the area that we heavily invest in and we would definitely like to see partners such as australia to come in and um to fund a lot of our number numbers of our uh, priority commodities that the country has i think um it would be also probably the same and i'm hearing my colleague from samoa was mentioned as well has mentioned agriculture sector as well and i think Vanuatu would look mainly into the agriculture sector as well in moving forward uh, having said that we would also look into investment on people to people because we know that uh, a lot of social issues that uh, have risen COVID has brought into the country as well uh, or some of the underlying issues that COVID has now uh, making them important issues uh, such as you know youth, women, uh, marginalized community. These are some of the issues as well that we would definitely uh, look for support uh, in supporting these people in adapting uh, to that. Um, in terms of the economy itself, uh, we've seen obviously Vanuatu has uh, and continue to have uh, the biggest number of uh, seasonal workers coming to work in Australia. And that also contributes uh, to the economy of the country. And uh, we're looking to continue this partnership uh, in making sure that people are coming to Australia and continue to work here and send remittances back home as well. Um, I think I, I heard uh, someone mention in terms of uh, the debt, uh, uh, the debt relief as well, the debt stress. I think this is also something that is very important that we look into it as well. Uh, as we know, um, and Minister probably would, would touch a word on that, but uh, Australia is also a member of the OECD countries. Uh, and uh, being a member of that, uh, definitely a member of that countries as well. And so uh, we're also probably advocating for debt reliefs as well and looking into different mechanisms for especially for small island developing countries, how uh, in the international community could support us in a better way. Uh, as you all know, Vanuatu got out recently from the LDC's country. Uh, and that means that, you know, getting out of the least developed countries um, comes with responsibilities and challenges. And that too, a number of our small island in the Pacific, which are already uh, out of that list also, would uh, probably face the same challenge as Vanuatu. Uh, and I think some of the uh, debt relief uh, strategies and mechanisms that we could also uh, look into uh, Australia for some support in, uh, in advocating for that, uh, 
and by by saying this, I'm thinking mainly out and loud about the vulnerability index um, that you know the uh, our um, well-being, the economic well-being of a country should not only be measured uh, based uh, solely on its GDP, but it could it should also take into account different factors, as especially uh, such as the impact of climate change that uh, we've already seen recently. The report from IPCC that uh, didn't put the Pacific Island countries in a very good uh, status when it comes to that. So vulnerability index could definitely be one that uh, we should also consider when we look at debt relief and uh, you know in supporting the these small and vulnerable economies. And so I'll stop here and uh, I'll let uh, the members of the panel uh, say more stuff about this. But I think this is really important to us that we look into this direction. I think I, I, I would like to raise, uh, sorry, uh, 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 the chair, I'd just like to raise one last word. I think right now, uh, when I speak, when I spoke about the agriculture, I'm thinking mainly about Kava itself, and uh, we're very much delighted that Australia has uh, announced uh, or had announced previously about the commercial pilot on Kava, and uh, we would definitely uh, uh, be looking forward to work closely with Australia in speeding up the process of this commercial pilot to be uh, to be uh, coming into realization. Thank you. Thank you. Well, a range of issues there. We've heard about COVID vaccines, agricultural support, obviously the seasonal worker, Pacific labour program, um, debt relief, a whole, a whole series of issues. Um, I'd like to ask Minister Seselja, how can Australia best assist the Pacific region given its special status as our family? Well, thank you very much, Siobhan. Um, and uh, Excellencies, great to see you all. Um, thank you for your contributions. Um, I'm sorry we're not able to meet in person at the moment, but I've enjoyed uh, those discussions we have had in person uh, in, in recent months. Um, Samson, can I can I say I'm, I'm disappointed you, you chose to dress so conservatively today. I was hoping that you might wear something bright and loud for us, but uh, you've gone very conservative. So next time uh, we'll go even further. But um, but look, it, thank you, Siobhan, for, for hosting and and thank you for the contributions. I've been uh, taking notes. Um, but certainly since I've taken on this role in December of last year and, and well before that, um, the government, of course, has been, when we look to the Pacific, as we always do, uh, we've looked to listen to the needs and the concerns of our Pacific family. And, and of course, at this time, um, with the COVID crisis, and we've heard, I think, from our from our homes there about the, the dual nature of these crises, um, uh, the, the health crisis uh, and the economic crisis and in the Pacific, that has been quite pronounced because, uh, you know, as we know, uh, there have been parts of the Pacific that have um, been completely COVID free uh, and done an extraordinary job uh, in preventing the spread of this disease. Uh, other places are battling outbreaks and battling those serious health impacts that come with that. But all of them, uh, regardless of their COVID status, have suffered the economic impacts uh, of uh, responding to this virus. And so when I think about what we can do going forward, I, the framework, I think, that the PM set out and the statement of principle that our Prime Minister set out some time ago when he said uh, that we have a, a moral and an economic responsibility to support our Pacific neighbours in getting vaccinated and coming through this crisis has very much framed uh, the way we've responded. So uh, whether that is in vaccine support, uh, and that's now around 1.7 million doses, Australian doses have gone into the Pacific, over two and a half million now into the region, and of course, many more to come. But the vaccine support is not just um, about dumping vaccines uh, by any stretch. It is about delivering uh, the vaccines that are much needed, but providing the end-to-end -end support. Uh, so we've backed that up with equipment, We've backed that up with um, with Osmat teams uh, where they've been required, uh, with other specialist support, uh, with testing equipment, uh, with logistics. Uh, all of these things are important uh, over and above uh, that uh, those much needed life saving vaccines. Uh, and we've been partnering uh, with countries in the region to make sure that we're able to deliver that. The other area, of course, is the is the economic side of things and as as I mentioned earlier uh, we know that for some countries that have been very very successful 
uh, in controlling COVID, in some cases, uh, no COVID, uh, though the economic impacts of those shut borders, particularly on tourism reliant economies, but beyond uh, even that, um, the economic disruption has been real. And so our $300 million package that we announced was all about um, helping stabilise governments and economies, helping them deliver social safety nets, health, uh, making sure that uh, air connectivity continued. Uh, we've provided uh, loans um, on, on top of those grants, uh, substantial loans uh, that help stabilise uh, government's responses. And we've also been investing in the future in infrastructure. Uh, that's important because that creates jobs now, but also economic uh, recovery. And then um, we've also, um, as, as we look at uh, other levels of support, I, I think the other thing that's been really important for, and it's been really mutually beneficial has been uh, the resumption of Pacific Labor. Uh, over 10,000 uh, have come since September, since we resumed. And that has, I think, been a real lifeline for our farmers who are putting food on our table. Uh, but also it's been, I know, very important to Pacific Island nations as those remittances are an important part of the economy and have become a more important part of the economy as other, as other sources of revenue have uh, significantly slowed down. Uh, going forward, uh, I've certainly heard um, what our homes have had to say today, uh, what their excellencies have had to say today, and, and certainly issues around tourism and agriculture. And, uh, you know, tourism... Um, uh, if we look at if we look at government support, it is absolutely dwarfed uh, by how much Australians would spend in the region uh, in tourism dollars in an ordinary year, and of course that has virtually completely dried up. Uh, and so, looking at getting populations vaccinated both here in Australia and in the Pacific, uh, and then looking at how we can safely start to travel again, and you know, uh, Qantas has announced flights uh, going to places like Fiji and that will go beyond I'm sure from about November December I think that's a great aspirational goal I think there's a lot of work to do uh, at both ends to make sure that it's a reality that Australians can start uh, traveling to the region and people from uh, Pacific Island nations can come to Australia uh, that'll be a great thing and the amount of money uh, that flows in ordinary times, as I say, dwarfs anything that governments are able to do despite our record $1.7 billion investment in the Pacific uh, in the last 12 months. So um, I'll probably leave it there, Chair. Uh, there is a lot to discuss. There's a lot of important issues that have been raised, but I know you've got other questions and I'm sure you'll you'll draw us out on that. And I'm keen to hear more from our, from our excellencies. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and you've touched on a range of incredibly important issues there. I want, I want to pull back into, into one issue that keeps getting raised, um, and it's been raised by all of you today so far in the panel, um, and that is, is this issue of, of the Pacific Labor Scheme. So we've, we've heard recently that the Australian government's announced a new class of agricultural visas to secure additional labor on Australian farms, and that the visa will operate as a pathway to permanent residency. Um, could this provide a pathway for economic renewal in the Pacific? So I'd, I'd just like to open that up to the panel, but obviously I think it's important to hear from you, Minister, on, on this issue. Would you like me to start, Siobhan, and then... Yeah, and I think that would be helpful. ...to others? Sure. Um, look, I think it's a very important pathway, um, the Pacific Labor Scheme and Seasonal Worker Program, uh, which has obviously been very, very important for a number of years, but as I touched on, um, has become, I think, more important during this time because of uh, the real economic impacts, particularly tourism, but we know uh, all sorts of other economic activity has been curtailed. So we restarted it in September um, and since then over 10,000 uh, have come from various Pacific Island nations into Australia. There's about 14,000 workers under the scheme in Australia at the moment. And our aim uh, and our Prime Minister announced uh, the intention to double uh, the numbers uh, that are coming in uh, by about March of next year. So that's another 12,500 uh, from when that was announced. So um, that's obviously a very substantial amount. Those, those remittances are important. As I say, it's very important to our economy. Uh, you, you talk about uh, the agricultural visa, and there's been a lot of discussion about what that means for the Pacific Labor Scheme. And um, I've made it clear, and I'll, I'll reiterate, and the Prime Minister's made it clear um, that our priority, when it comes to um, when it comes to labour in agriculture in particular, but going beyond, 
we are going to continue to prioritise the Pacific Labor Scheme and Seasonal Worker Program. And in fact, we're going through a process now where we are going to improve and streamline that process. Uh, but that that those schemes will continue to grow. We're going to build on those. Uh, they are important to us and they are important to our, our family in the Pacific and we value uh, those schemes for, the, for both of those reasons. Uh, and so we put an absolute premium on it. Um, there's no doubt, though, that our, um, that our uh, agriculture sector is suffering from pretty significant shortages. And so not only will we need to significantly boost the number of uh, people coming through the Pacific Labor Scheme, but we will look for other ways and the agricultural visa is part of that. Of course, we've, we've seen um, issues around uh, free trade agreements with the UK and some of the changes to the rules around backpackers, which um, necessitated some adjustments as well. So it's really important that our farmers have the workers that they need. Uh, that's for our export markets, but for also for Australians to be able to get uh, the food and fibre uh, produce that they need. Uh, but just to make it clear, as we go through that process, and we will be engaging uh, with Pacific Island nations now as we go through a reform process to improve. Uh, so we'll be listening to that feedback. And of course, some of that feedback will start today, no doubt, but uh, uh, the feedback on what needs to change or improve. But uh, that's very much the pathway that we've set out, and it will be very, a very important part of the economic recovery. Okay, I'd like to open it up to some of the other panellists. Um, thank you, Siobhan, if I can just quickly yes, come in. Of course, yeah. um, <clears throat> I think um, there is something to say about this uh, pathway to, um, you know, the res permanent residency uh, that's under the agriculture visa. In some ways, it, you could say it, it's a double-edged sword for, you know, the Pacific in terms of, uh, you know, the drain of skilled and uh, semi-skilled workers, and especially those who will have been under the Pacific scheme. Um, you know, for quite some time and had probably developed skills that could actually enhance, um, you know, the whether it's horticulture or other forms of, um, of sectors, the sectors that we're working in, other forms of, um, of engaging in, 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 this, in economic activity. But I think to me, yes, it, it, the uh, labor schemes are certainly, you know, part and parcel of um, looking at uh, economic recovery for the region. Um, and we've all been engaged with uh, the government for quite some time now in terms of looking at this new roadmap on sustainable uh, you know, practice of the, uh, implementation of the um, mobility schemes. I think if there's one thing I might like to explore with respect to the, uh, this pathway, if there is a chance going into the future, and, and we're talking now bringing in climate change with respect to uh, climate refugees that might come out as a result of uh, you know, um, uh, rising sea levels, uh, Tuvalu, Kiribati being the worst off at the moment. Um, I think we're heading that way um, as we see the uh, progressive impact of climate change of the uh, Pacific and that there is real um, uh, concern that there will be you know, climate change refugees. And so if there is some way of looking at both medium to long-term as to whether um, the migration, I mean, uh, migration, the um, labor mobility schemes can be seen as an instrument towards some way of facilitating into the future such a pathway, um, you know, for not necessarily that, but also pass a parallel way of uh, looking to where uh, Australian other nations could look at um, accommodating uh, the impact of climate change on the potential real threat of having refugees coming out of that. Thank you. Thank you. And that was a position that was long put forward by former President Anote Tong, um, but also resisted by many other Pacific leaders, the pathway of climate refugees. Um, any other uh, yes. panelists? On the, yeah, on the uh, new AG visa, uh, my, my only hope is that the uh, terms and conditions of the AG visa will be exactly the same as the uh, seasonal workers program and the PLS uh, visas and that the, uh, for the latter two, 
uh, to be fair, if the option of uh, permanent residency should also be uh, uh, given to the latter two. How and when that will offer, I, I guess it's a matter for each country to decide. And also on the age limit, I think the current age limit for the two schemes is from 21 to 45, I think. Our preference now is to increase it to 55, since a lot of our workers with the necessary skills are around that age. And also I think their experience, and I'm sure a lot of uh, employers would like uh, to employ uh, you know, experienced workers who can take up senior management roles. And on the, uh, also on the current arrangements, I think the SWP and the PLS are only confined to rural and regional Australia. Maybe perhaps we should also start looking about it, uh, opening up the urban and metropolitan Australia, where the demand for semi-skilled uh, labor is, uh, is very, very high. Uh, I thought I'll just uh, flag those uh, issues for future consideration, especially in terms of, uh, you know, making these uh, schemes uh, very well. But otherwise, it's a very, very important scheme. And uh, I'm sure it benefits both countries, Australia and Solomon Islands. So it's a win-win situation. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. And <clears throat> can I just uh, come in quickly and, uh, and uh, mention a few words around the uh, Pacific labor uh, mobility, but especially agriculture visa. I think uh, from our side, um, we've had a couple of uh, meetings with the uh, DFAT in terms of, uh, you know, getting more information in terms of agriculture visa. I think what on way forward, we would like to see more engagement uh, with DFAT in terms of uh, the agriculture visa itself. And I joined my colleague from the Solomon Islands uh, uh, by saying that if the terms and conditions could uh, be uh, exactly the same as ours and not making one more favorable to the other one. And as we all know, Pacific uh, labor mobility is so important to us, to us Pacific Island countries, but also with Timor-Leste uh, that, you know, it sends uh, important uh, economic uh, remittance back to our countries to support our economy. Um, another thing that I'd like also to flag is in terms of, uh, uh, we, we are looking also and we're, we're engaging in terms of finding out more um, in terms of, uh, um, uh, you know, the remittance back to our Pacific Island countries and Timor-Leste, uh, we, we have some data on that. We, we know that some in international organizations have undertaken some studies in that, but we would also like to see also our contributions as Pacific uh, family to Australian economy in terms of knowing if uh, some studies could be undertaken by a number of researchers that are with us here today online, but also through you, Minister, uh, if we could see some studies done here in Australia to, uh, to value our impact in terms of the Australian economy on how much in terms of the monetary value, how much we contribute to the Australian economy by being here in Australia, not only for our uh, farmers that are so important to us because they put uh, food in our plates, but also to our uh, rural towns as well in finding out how much uh, of our workers, how much of their savings or how much of their earnings are invested back into these rural communities that they live in. And I think um, it would be really important to, to, to look into that and moving forward and understanding, you know, mutual benefits to us, as Minister has mentioned. It's so important to both of us because it not only contribute to our farmers' um, in um, ensuring that they put food on our plate, but also uh, in uh, ensuring that we get the remittance also back to the Pacific. So I think my call would be that uh, the researchers that are here, uh, you know, if we could look into some kind of studies like that to uh, evaluate the contri economic contributions that uh, our Pacific workers and Timor-Leste workers have contributed to the Australian economy. Thank you. Thanks, Samson. Siobhan, could I respond briefly to a couple of those points? Sure. Um, so thank you. Um, on the questions around, um, and Samson's call, I think, on, on more study, I think the, the department is always looking at these, these kind of economic impacts, but we've got a number of eminent people uh, on this call, so we can have more discussions about what potential research programs there are to, to perhaps drill deeper. On um, the specific issues that have been raised around age limits, um, I think that is something we're very carefully considering uh, and we're very open to uh, looking at potential changes to the age limits uh, between 21 and 45. So that's something that I think we'll have more to say on soon. Um, and also on the terms and conditions um, that have been raised. So we're, we're very much proceeding on 
the basis. So we've said we're going to reform uh, PLS and, and SWP, uh, and those things, th those moves are coming. Um, but also with the ag visa, we've said that it would it would mirror uh, the kind of terms and conditions that we see uh, with our Pacific schemes. And I think that's really important. It's a really important point to emphasise because there's been a little bit of commentary uh, even in the last couple of days that sort of suggested something quite the opposite, uh, not coming from the government, but from some critics. Uh, and so I would just make that point again uh, that it's very much designed to mirror uh, what we have and build on and complement, uh, not in any way undermine. Um, and and Ari makes the the great point about um, uh, you know if there was a pathway to permanency, what does that mean from a brain drain uh, perspective? And of course, that's where all of these steps forward will be done in conjunction and in consultation uh, with our Pacific neighbours. So you know we would obviously be having those discussions and hearing uh, from your governments about uh, you know what kind of improvements you want and what are some things that you might be concerned about as well. Mm, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, it's been raised on a number of occasions already uh, by the panel. So I want us now to start um, having a little discussion around these issues of, of climate change. Um, so the recent IPCC report has, has put forward this um, very clear scientific picture that over the next 20 years, global temperatures are expected to reach or exceed 1.5 degrees uh, of warming. This has a number of very serious implications in the Pacific, including dramatic increases in sea level rise, increased intensity of cyclones and declining availability of fresh water, just to name a few. Pacific leaders continue to state that climate change remains the greatest threat to the future of the region. And this is very important in terms of Pacific Island Forum statements that have come out. So the Boy Declaration, for example, Kainaki Lua, the Kainaki Lua Declaration. So how in this context of, of the challenges to regionalism, um, the, the gentlemen's agreement challenges that we've seen from Micronesia, how do Australia and the Pacific create a shared future with attention to the growing climate change impacts on the Pacific countries, um, but also to these kind of challenges attached to regionalism that we've seen over the last year? So I'm pulling together these two issues now of climate change, but also regionalism. And I, I open this now for discussion by the panel. <laughs> it's, a, it's a big a whopping. Issue, really. <laughs> I, you know, if, maybe I'll step in and uh, risk my neck on this one. I think Please that um, with respect to climate change, I mean, we all know the dire impact of that. And uh, we do respect the Australia for the stand it's taken on, um, you know, uh, climate change with respect to the Paris Agreement and uh, other <coughs> climate agreements. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think that um, there are still other areas that we could explore together. And uh, we've got the Global, um, you know, um, uh, Fund, Environment Fund, and other financing mechanisms that the islands have fallen on in terms of uh, seeking um, financing for adaptation uh, projects uh, to build resilience um, in the economy, in their countries. But if there's anything, I think uh, it has been raised and this is the Pacific um, Forum Secretariat has been pushing this, it's to look at also the possibility of a resilience fund. Now, when crises occur, usually it's more on a national basis rather than on an individual basis. And most often the um, effects of assistance that comes in, um, even though it's administered widely by the government, the trickle down effects to those at the grassroots, it's actually quite significantly uh, less than expected. So there's no real material impact when uh, the vulnerability of these people um, is exposed, um, you know, whether it's uh, cyclones and flooding and that sort of thing. So there's also a lot of bu bureaucracy involved in administering um, funds. And also the other side of the coin is that we, in accessing some of these funds, the amount of bureaucracy, uh, you know, it's just too much. And they sometimes have to bring, bring in capacity outside capacity to assist governments to design, um, you know, projects that fit in. Um, and yet we're talking about, you know, real lives being lost and exposed. And so we, the 
um, Secretariat had raised this about building in contributions from various uh, development partners interested in building a resilience fund that could be tapped and go straight into these you know, vulnerable sectors um, at the grassroots when these things happen. Uh, so that way, at least you can say that um, at the end of the day, uh, you not, don't just cover just about everybody, but these vulnerable exposed parts of the, of, of the community. Thank you, I'll stop there. Mm, thank you. So another, another panelist who would like to make a contribution. Yeah, okay. um, uh, I'll take it. <laughs> yeah, first of all, on the first question you posed about how do Australia and the Pacific create a shared future, you know, with the growing climate change uh, impacts. Well, uh, I personally don't think Australia and the Pacific need to create a shared future. They already have, thanks to our geographical uh, proximity, historical connections, including colonization trade and investment relationships, education linkages and cultural exchanges. So yeah, we already have that uh, shared future. And at our leaders uh, virtual summit just, just last month uh, on 6th of August, they did reaffirm that uh, climate change is still the single greatest threat facing the blue Pacific and recommit to the goals of the Paris Agreement. And now we are just a couple of weeks away uh, from the COP26 in Glasgow. And I'm sure there are a lot of uh, discussions now, particularly among the biggest emitters to the agreed target of net zero emissions by 2050. And to also increase their contributions to climate funds. And here I must acknowledge Australia's uh, contribution of 500 million for climate adaptation in the region for the period 2020 to 2025 and uh, its uh, technology investment roadmap to drive uh, renewable energy. I think that's something that uh, we have to acknowledge and uh, you know, commend Australia for coming up with that uh, roadmap because that certainly would help in terms of uh, meeting uh, you know, all our Paris commitments. And just uh, last Friday, I was heartened to read in the uh, Canberra Times that uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Barnaby Joyce uh, is uh, leaving the door open uh, to a deal with the Prime Minister on net zero emissions by 2050. So I hope uh, by come uh, the uh, Glasgow uh, climate change meeting, I think something positive will come out of the uh, political process here in, the, uh, in Australia. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, hi, Commissioner Fari, if you'd like to make a contribution. Sorry, you're just on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you so much uh, to the panelists, uh, but also for some of these great questions coming up. Uh, I'd also like to add my voice in terms of uh, the first question that you raised in terms of climate change. Um, I think uh, I'll join my colleague here by saying also that um, um, we already were in this region together. We're in this region as a family, uh, the Vuvale spirit. And I think we've uh, we uh, we have stressed uh, on that partnership, but also that family spirit a lot together. And uh, that also leads to the fact that um, uh, we're also custodian of this region and that uh, we have to look after this region and that whatever that affects one member of the family could also uh, uh, affect the other member of the family as well. So I think uh, we've already seen that we have a lot of corporations already. We work already closely together, whether it be uh, on uh, economic... Uh, um, uh, economic lane, but also in terms of education, health, uh, infrastructure, we already work a lot in and collaborate a lot in the in these areas. But what I would like to stress on in terms of climate change, um, I would I would say that um, I think I would like to see more about of transfer of knowledge between uh, what the states and territories are, are doing in Australia as well, because I have visited uh, this great country a number of times, and I see that there's a lot of good uh, mechanisms, a lot of good uh, examples of adaptation to climate change across different states and territories um, in Australia that 
we could also look into how to tap into that in terms of uh, the transfer of knowledge to our Pacific Island countries so that, you know, uh, in the Pacific, we're mostly adapting to climate change. We're not so much about mitigation, but mostly about adapting. So how can we adopt some of these mechanisms or some of these good practices at the state and territory level in, uh, in here and then, you know, transfer of this knowledge back to our countries? Uh, I think it would be great to see more collaborations in terms of sharing of the knowledge, but also sharing of the experiences as well. Uh, another big thing that I'd like to mention as well is in terms of education, because it's okay to transfer this knowledge back to the Pacific in, in terms of how to adapt to climate change, but uh, you also need to build the manpower as well in that across the Pacific. So education is also another area that we collaborate a lot on. And so far, I think we've uh, uh, most of the Pacific Island countries, uh, but especially, you know, our students coming to Australia to study here, we've relied a lot on scholarships. Um, I'd like to see a further step into that as well in terms of how can we look into different partnerships in education in opening up the market in Australia as well, whereby our students can come and study these technologies here. Our students can be open, uh, you know, can these technologies can be open to them where they can come and study here and get this good information about um, all these transfer of technologies that I was talking about earlier uh, and then, you know, bring those things back to the Pacific. And so maybe we could also look into a partnership where we could uh, probably think of a model of opening up a little bit of education system rather than um, relying a lot on, 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 on scholarships for our people to come and, and study here by means of scholarships. And as we know, education can, uh, is very costly. And so uh, we could probably think of a model where we could relax a bit of the system where, whereby students can come and study here and maybe, um, I'm thinking loud here, but maybe you know, paying the same, um, tuition fees as Australians in providing them that support whereby, you know, it's an indirect support, but in the long run, it will help them because they will be then able to, uh, to, uh, to understand and to study and to get all this knowledge about technologies, especially in terms of climate change and bring them back home. But also, um, I'm, I'm trying to go far here in terms of face surplus as well. We've seen this economic partnership uh, with uh, Australia, New Zealand, but also with us. Um, uh, that means that we will also need a manpower that is qualified to handle that. And in order to be able to handle that, uh, it's also good to look once again into the education sector in opening up these tertiary education in Australia uh, to our Pacific Island countries where they can come here and maybe uh, probably pay the same price as New Zealanders that come and study here rather than uh, be considered as international uh, students in Australia. So I'll stop here. But I think the transfer of knowledge, but you also need to build manpower behind that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, Minister, I'd just like to ask you, Minister Seselja, to offer a response to this question, and then I'd like to open up um, to questions more broadly from the other people who are in, uh, in our discussion today um, to invite them to ask questions of the panel. Sure. Thank, thank you, Siobhan. Um, look, there's a number of things there, and I'll, I'll briefly touch on them. I think, I think a number of the points have been made around commitment to the Paris Agreement, um, and so we take those commitments very, very seriously. Um, we've reduced our emissions by 21% uh, since 2005. That's, that's uh, about double uh, the OECD average, so the average of developed nations. I think that's important. There, there's record investments at the moment, uh, as Samson's touched on, in renewable energy in Australia. So the take-up of solar... Uh, is the highest in the world. Uh, the take up of wind is uh, right up there. Uh, so when it comes to renewables, we are really investing uh, record amounts. When it comes to um, really dealing with some of the issues on the ground in the region, um, we've put forward $500 million for uh, climate resilience funds in, in the region. And that involves some really important things. So it can be things as simple as uh, schools being built uh, in Fiji to be able to withstand category four cyclones. So obviously that is very, very important as we've seen cyclones uh, in recent times. Uh, it, it can involve flood mitigation. Uh, it can involve uh, renewable uh, energy in the region. So we're seeing uh, actual examples of, and, and that has a win-win because obviously um, energy security is really important uh, for the economy uh, but if it's done also in a low emissions way we're then making that contribution in, in terms of our climate change goals and our emissions reduction goals. Um, 
the point that Samson made, I think, is really important just to touch on about knowledge transfer, because one of the things the Prime Minister has, our Prime Minister has said has been that um, with two thirds of emissions uh, coming from the developing world, uh, and he has said he doesn't want to see the developing world held back through taxes, what he wants to see is the world coming together to develop the new technologies so that uh, economic growth can occur uh, whilst reducing emissions right around the world. And that's the, that's the way uh, we will see the goals of the Paris Agreement uh, met is when all countries ha have that ability to have economic development uh, as well as reducing their emissions at the same time, particularly through energy uh, and other areas. So uh, that technology roadmap is important. And so knowledge transfer is important. But Siobhan, just the, I know you combine two things with climate change and, and the voice of the region and regionalism. Just finally on that, and I might bring those two together. I mean, obviously we're working very closely with our um, uh, colleagues in the PIF, our Micronesian colleagues, uh, you know, pushing and, and encouraging everyone to stay together. And, and, and for example, I think uh, when we look at the issue of climate change, the voice of the Pacific together, the voice of, of PIF has been a very powerful one far more powerful than I think the voices of any of those individual nations would be. And I would just say that that perhaps highlights the importance of finding a way forward, uh, of listening to the concerns that have been raised. You know, I've had many discussions uh, with counterparts uh, in Micronesia and beyond about their concerns, uh, yeah. about what reforms might be necessary in order to make sure that, uh, that, that the PIF can, can continue in its you know, with, with its current membership uh, and perhaps with some reforms going forward. So I think those two issues come together well that on, on, a, on an issue that's, that's very important to the region, that advocacy has been loud around the world, but I think it's been far more powerful because it's been quite a united voice. Fabulous. So I'd like us now um, to just uh, please join with me on reflecting on, um, in spite of all the difficulties of joining together in these virtual spaces, we've had this amazing insight into the Pacific and, and the fact that the Pacific does reach into Canberra in all these very exceptional ways. Um, please join with me in thanking our panelists today and um, the way in which they brought us this, this very complex and um, rich set of perspectives. So thank you very much to all our panelists. Thank you to all of you for joining with us um, and, and really engaging in what I think has been a really, um, a really fascinating panel discussion today. So thank you very much to all of you.